another gentleman that we've worked with for a very long, for the last few years, and uh, representing the ARRL is Emergency Preparedness Assistant Manager, Ken Bailey, K1FUG. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. As Rob said, I'm Ken Bailey, K1FUG. Assistant Manager for Emergency Preparedness at Fleet Headquarters. And I'm pleased to be here today. The main reason being, when I left Connecticut, I flew out ahead of a snowstorm. So I'm happy to be here in sunny Florida. I had to leave my wife back there. Uh, she has to contend with taking care of all the snow, which amounted to only about two inches. So. She's not too, too uh, 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 having a problem with it. Oh, I should add that before I came out here, I developed a cold. And kind of worried me a little bit because here I'm going to be a speaker and I had lost my voice. Uh, I have a little water here to kind of wet my throat a little bit as we go along. So if I start to fade away, you will understand. Now this presentation is tailored for the new ham operator. And by new ham, I mean someone who's maybe just gotten licensed. Also, a long time ham who has a lot of experience but is just now getting into emergency communications. So they, they want to learn a little bit more about what's involved. So we're going to talk a little bit more about procedures and equipment as we go along. Now, some of you may know a lot of what uh, I'm going to talk about. And I'm actually going to be mentioning a couple of uh, things that you've already heard. Um, we sort of uh, put together our presentations independently. But these are the important things that we believe in that you should all know. Now. Obviously, whenever you have a severe weather issue, and we're here to talk about hurricanes, but throughout the country, you have tornadoes. Up in New England during the winter, we get some ice storms, severe snowstorms, we'll lose power. And when that happens, your ability to communicate can be hindered, can be affected, and we're here to talk about what we can do to minimize that. Now, you know that for since the beginning of time, we learned how to communicate. And amateur radio is just one of many ways in which we can communicate. We've been doing it now for well over 100 years when it comes to emergency communications, starting back in the early 1900s. When amateur radio first became involved, in reporting, of all things, stolen vehicles. Some of the very first communications involved stolen vehicles that were spotted as they passed through some of these small towns. So since then, we've been reporting a lot of weather-related uh, situations, which we've become known uh, pretty well for today. We're, you know, we have the ability to do this, excuse me, yeah. We have the ability to communicate, and we certainly uh, do that often. Now, I'm gonna talk a little bit about a toolbox, and it could be a physical toolbox, but it's more of a concept. Think of amateur radio as a tool in that toolbox. Everything you know, everything you've learned here, before you came here um, as an amateur radio operator, everything in life, school, can go in that toolbox. It's just a, an ability to package everything that you know together uh, in one package. And we will start with training, local training in your community. So when you join ARIES, 
you probably asked or should have asked, what kind of training do I need to have? What kind of training would I receive? And ask for and or, you know, take that training and uh, use it as stepping stones to more. Map out a training plan with your local areas group and take all the training that you can that's available. Now the ARRL has some training courses, emergency communications training, and you probably know them as EC001, which is the introduction to emergency communications. Uh, there is a more advanced course, EC016, which is for leaders in ARIES. They'll find this uh, more appropriate for their positions. And of course, there's the PIO training, public information officer training, which is not exactly amateur radio related, but it gives you a good idea of how to communicate with others, with people of the press, because definitely when you are deployed or you're communicating on behalf of your served agency, you're going to be approached by the press or other individuals trying to get some information about what you're doing. And you want to know what you can and cannot say. And as a PIO, you generally learn to refer the questions to the leaders and the served agency that you're working with. The Emergency Communications Training by EMI, the Emergency Management Institute, uh, FEMA provides all these courses that are available. Now you should all try to take at least the 100, 200, 700, and 800 courses that are available. Uh, how many have taken those courses? Okay, great. They're kind of fun to do, and they're free. So why not take advantage of them? Uh, there's the professional development series, which uh, are an additional courses that you could take. And if you do, they send you a nice certificate that you can hang on your wall. Wallpaper, we all like that. Now here's the Department of Homeland Security, which provides an auxiliary emergency communications course. They oftentimes tie this to Dayton, so if you go out to Dayton, you might find that a course is being offered nearby. And it is also free. It's mostly uh, geared towards the public safety agencies and how amateur radio operators can assist them in times of need. It's a good course. By all means, if you have the opportunity, go for it. The National Weather Service, and uh, through Skywarn, offers quite a few courses also. Now you heard Rob talk about Skywarn. You can get Skywarn training throughout your communities. And uh, depending on how active your Skywarn program is in your community, they may publish the times and dates for the courses that are going to be offered. See if you can fit them into your schedule. They're great. They're not long, maybe two, three hours, an evening or two. And uh, you'll come away with a lot of information about weather and how you can offer your assistance in reporting severe weather. Comment. And you'll see the uh, link up there. That's a great program. Uh, they offer all kinds of courses online. Most of them are geared for the uh, meteorologists, the professionals, but there's a lot of courses also available for students to take of all ages. And if you look through their online catalog, you might find something of interest. Spaceweather.com is, is a lot of fun. Uh, learning about propagation and what happens uh, when uh, there are many sunspots that are going to affect communications, you want to find out how that is affected. Uh, that's a course for someone else, but by all means, take a look at it and see if uh, you can learn a little something about uh, propagation, which we'll cover a little bit more in a little bit. 
uh, sky-worn spotter training that uh, Rob was uh, uh, talking about. And something that uh, I participated in for a few years is Skywarn Recognition Day. Anybody here do that? Great. If you don't know what it is, briefly, you get together at your local National Weather Service office, and the hands utilizing VHF, a VoIP, um, they're utilizing high frequency communications equipment to talk with other weather service offices throughout the country. And the numbers oh, amount to about maybe 80 offices or so. They're not always active on the air on Skywarn Recognition Day, but you try to work as many as you can and you get different levels of uh, uh, participation. And so you might, uh, I can't remember all of them, but uh, you might receive the, uh, a certificate for reaching the tornado level or something of that nature. It's a lot of fun. So it's the first week in December, if I'm not mistaken, weekend in December. A lot of fun. Now, I'm going to digress a little bit. We've been talking about, uh, you know, participation, participation in amateur radio. Safety. I cannot stress that enough. If you're in the hurricane zone, if you're in the path of the hurricane, and an evacuation is given, don't hesitate. Just leave. Go to your reported shelter. Uh, bring your equipment if you can with you. Bring some personal equipment that you feel you may need. But by all means, don't try to ride it out if you're in the flood zone, for instance, in the path of that hurricane. Well, that goes for any kind of uh, severe weather conditions. Uh, FEMA has published an online course called IS-22. It's all about safety. Are you ready? Are you ready to participate in uh, uh, for instance, uh, sheltering during severe weather. Are you able to protect your family during this, uh, this time? So it's an online course. Uh, they, have, uh, they have publications also that you could take, but I suggest that you take a look at this it, it's uh, involved, it's, it's quite lengthy, but uh, if you, uh, I think in one of your packets you have a, an emer emergency plan. I think that's based on this IS-22. Now, how you prepare for radio communications depends on whether you're in the path of the hurricane or outside of that zone. Remember your IS-22 training when you review it. It gives you a lot of information of what to do. Remember safety. Uh, make sure your family's protected before you deploy yourself and your radio equipment. Uh, also, when you do deploy, you need to consider not only the safety, but Radio, your personal equipment, uh, survival gear, for instance, what are you going to bring with you when uh, you do decide you're going to ride out that hurricane? It could be something as simple as a small go kit. This is an example of a VHF, UHF uh, go kit. It's uh, like in a camera bag, something you can put together quite easily. Equipment you have right at home that's easily available. Uh, certainly this is just minimal. You could uh, package this together uh, with as much uh, equipment as you feel necessary. Food, water, etc. cetera, uh, might be included in here. Uh, meds, of course. Uh, whatever you feel you will need for your particular situation. Now, uh, for those new to emergency communications, you're probably going to get set up with VHF, UHF transceivers. 
buy the best that you can uh, afford. Uh, if you don't know what's good, ask someone. Uh, if you're in your Aries group and you're just getting started, ask uh, some of the others about the equipment that they have, what they carry, why they carry that particular one, and uh, get as much detailed information as you can. And there are many inexpensive transceivers today, and they all work very well. And one of the nice things about some inexpensive transceivers is if you drop it in the water, you lose it, it walks away, no big deal. You can just go out and buy another one for maybe $30, $40. If you lose one that you spent $300 for, uh, it's going to hurt a little bit more. So, by all means, you know, whatever you can afford and uh, think about those inexpensive ones, which seem to work pretty well, Chip. Although some people may say otherwise. Be active with your on the air events, and we'll get into more of this. But your Aries nets, oftentimes they, we, they wear, uh, meet weekly, nightly. Uh, don't forget that on the weekends, the uh, marathons, the walkathons, and the parades, uh, the other events that take place. Don't wait until an emergency happens before you test your equipment out at these events. High frequency communications seems to be uh, what uh, newcomers are not involved with, mainly because of licensing. If, if you're fairly new and you only have a technician license, you're going to be restricted as to what frequencies that you can operate at. So please consider upgrading licenses. If you're a technician, go for the general. And putting together a high frequency go kit, as like one pictured here, is fairly easily. Um, just a power supply and uh, mid, or maybe a larger battery, uh, wire antennas uh, for 40 and 20 meters seem to work out pretty well. A simple high frequency transceiver, fairly small, uh, maybe putting out 50 watts or so, would be more than adequate. And learn how propagation works, because that's going to become pretty important when you're deployed in the field. The value of high frequency communications to, in the form of Aries nets, traffic nets, hurricane watch net, and WX4 NAC, which we were very well informed about previously. I cannot overemphasize the need to participate in these deaths. This is where most of your training is, is going to be had. Inside the hurricane zone, you're going to probably need emergency power. I say probably because there have been many opportunities when I've been deployed where we never lost power. But I was always prepared just in case. Remember that generators can be dangerous, so you want to have a very thorough understanding and knowledge of, of their use and how to set them up and the fact that especially on high frequencies they generate a lot of noise whether they're the simple small generators and or some of the larger commercial ones there's a youtube video there that uh, published by the awrl where the narrator bob allison has tested out uh, several generators and he explains um, a good deal about them in general and how you can reduce the high frequency interference. Solar power is certainly a given, especially when the sun finally comes out and then there's no commercial power yet, but you can certainly use solar to charge batteries and uh, that will get you back on the air. Antennas, backup antennas. <coughs> 
Now, I've lost two Yaggies through the years, not to hurricanes, but to ice storms. The uh, ice can really weigh down your, your aluminum and cause it to snap and break. So backup antennas, wire works extremely well. Ideally, 40 meters and 20 meters are where you want to have a backup antennas for. Uh, however, you know, other bands like 80 meters and 30 meters uh, certainly is going to come in very handy when you're trying, trying to provide communications. Uh, it does nothing really, uh, you know, complicated. Just a piece of wire, make a dipole with a center insulator, and uh, whether you use, uh, you know, a form of twin lead or, you know, uh, uh, balanced uh, cable, coax, anything that you have on hand will probably work. Most of your rigs today can be utilized with a tuner, and you'll get yourself on the air, uh, even with low power. Here's uh, an example a list of the various links that were talked about today. I just put them up here because I wanted to reemphasize that uh, these are the important areas that you probably want to spend more time uh, thinking about. Now, you don't always lose internet connectivity, but I would always make sure that if you got your, your computer set up, that uh, you check out uh, and obtain any information that might be available via the internet before you do lose power. And also, you could use your cell phone if you have one as a Wi-Fi hotspot. It's definitely something fairly easy to do, and you can check that out before you know <coughs> an emergency exists where you may absolutely need that to have internet connectivity. So if you could practice doing that. Will be all set. Now, outside the hurricane zone, this is mostly geared towards high frequency communications. You're away from the area of the hurricane path. You've got some great antennas. You've got some high frequency radios, maybe with amplifiers. You can be heard. You know you can be heard because you're very active on the air. You uh, enter contest, which you seem to enjoy, and you check its nets. You rag you with your friends, and you know your equipment because you've been testing it out. Now, here we go again with the Hurricane Watch Net, a formal association with the NHC. We, we just heard this. Monitor the Hurricane Watch Net on 14325 or 7.26 megahertz. And uh, learn how they, they pro, you know, provide procedure, or procedures. Excuse me. And go out of the water. Um, you will uh, get an idea of what information they're looking for. There was um, Hurricane Irene uh, that I was actually uh, at uh, League headquarters, and uh, when Irene came ashore, we were feeding information to the Hurricane Watch them. And I think I might have surprised them momentarily when. I uh, called them to say I had uh, information from Connecticut locally, uh, collected information on IRE. And I was signing the call W1AW from League headquarters. It kind of uh, surprised them. They didn't expect to hear from us, I guess. So uh, uh, we had the best of antennas and equipment and we could hear them, and they could hear us. And it worked out very well for us that day. Now, oftentimes you'll hear people say, oh, uh, I'll go out on field day, bring my equipment out in the field. 
and I will test my equipment out. And that's fine. And you should do that. It's a lot of fun. It really is. But it only comes one weekend a year. If that's the only time you bring your equipment out to test it, you may find that when you have, actually have to use it, it's just not going to work for you. So if you want to be helpful, the more you know, the more useful you will be. Take advantage of all those online courses, whether it's with the ARRL or through FEMA, or there's a lot of colleges and universities that offer courses, whether they're face-to-face -face in the classroom or online, they're available. And oftentimes, you'll find that these classes are free. They're they're, they don't cost you anything, and uh, you might actually enjoy taking some classes going back to school. So get on the air and have some fun. Participate in contests. Join the nets. Communicate. By doing so, you'll test your equipment. You'll learn about propagation and... That's it. There's some contact information. <laughs> and my apologies about my voice.